are, those are quick tidbits about how to present. You know, if you can come out from there, if you know your material well enough at the end, and the camera's there, and they're shooting you here, but you want to pay off the last sentence, how about instead of stoke, right? You're not in stoke here. How about you come out and get and gesture and you pay off the presentation? Just recount it. And so there you have it. Today I gave you a water bottle that's made for cycling. It's lightweight and uh, is more easily accessible than anything on the market. Is it a great idea? I think so. Do you think it could be funded? I've talked to people and I think it could be. Boom, right? If you say it, your audience will live it. That's what I got for you. That's what we got. Questions of Mr. Drasnan. All right. What did you learn? Raise your hand. Tell me what did you learned from what Ray just told you. Own it. Confidence is key. Mm -hmm. Different. Be different. Any else? Make yourself believe it. Little mind, little mind. Yep. Entertain. Yeah, get yeah. played. Like, with all these options. <laughs> Who's going first? Did you see it? Right, come on. Let's get it. <laughs> How about it? Ray, get a new sheet of paper for us, buddy. Uh, for those of you uh, who would like to uh, check out what we've got going on, uh, this is live off of uh, my YouTube channel. I'll be shared out on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on Twitter. Stay with me, tag, uh, hashtag MVP 3 <laughs> if you guys want to chime in and uh, join in. Right. Everybody's watching. You can let your mom know. You can let your mom know. Hey, mom, I'll be up soon. Right. Uh, so that's it. So we share your brilliance. Be awesome. Have fun. It's just that easy. For a hundred bucks, I'll do any one of your story. Any takers. Yeah. Can I practice, uh, paper bag? Paper bag, yeah. <laughs> you can do one over paper bag on top of your head. And then do you have a clicker? A clicker? So uh, you didn't, uh, no. Who was this? Hey, Ryan, can you, can you come click through the slides for me? I got you. There you go. That's a problem. <laughs> Thank you. 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 And then just to clarify, 2.30 to 3 minutes or just 3.30? 2.30 to 3. Okay. All right. I'll point to you. Or you can go click. <laughs> Ready? Yeah. All right, buddy. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about the product protector because I believe in safety for everyone. So the problem here is that people can, not everyone is safe walking around on the streets, especially women. It's a terrible problem. So I created this product. What it's going to be is a sleep bracelet that you want to wear combined with mace. Mace is effective but non-lethal, so it'll work greatly. So our target market here is girls who like to go out downtown, Vegas, wherever you get nice and dressed up, not going to be camera purse. Most girls I know, they take their cell phone, their ID, and their debit card, and they put it in their bra, and they go out. That's it. But the thing is, when you're drunk or drinking, you're at your most vulnerable, so I think that's when you need to be protected. OK, so the innovations I made here. For this product, from when I started, I noticed from my surveys that I need multiple different bracelets for multiple different outfits. Um, it's going to start formal, and then it's going to have semi-formal, and then casual, because I want people to always be wearing these bracelets, so then you'll always be protected. The second one is ease of use, because there's no point to a product if it's not easy to use, especially when you're being assaulted. You don't want to be like, hey, can you wait a minute while I get out my safeties, whatever. And the third one is this is the current wearable pepper spray. That's disgusting. So next. Um, my purpose for this project is I am a frat manners man, and we learn about take back the night and safety for women. And the cool thing about frat manners talks about safe sex and rape prevention. And that I loved it. I did presentations about frat manners. Um, it's a great program, and um, we just we want the world to be a safer place. We learned about take back the night, which is a program in which. Um, it's a nonprofit and a movement so that people can walk safely at night because I think everyone deserves that right. Next. 
click. This is a little bit more. This is where my passion comes from, Brat Manners. It's fraternity men against negative environments and rape situations. There's a lot of us. It's all fraternity men because fraternity men, they get a negative stigma. And that's not a good thing. There's a couple of us that are really good guys, and we want to make a difference. And then also, my passion in life, I learned this a long time ago. My mom always helped me with everything. I've always got a lot of help from my family, so I want to help everyone else in the world. That's what I'm devoting my life to. In conclusion today, I really care about this product, and I need everyone's help. So if you could give me feedback, comments. I created Product Protector because product I thought means fashion, and Protector means safety. So especially from the girls in class, if you could give me some help on a name, anything you think will make this product better, I want this is my five-year plan to make this an actual thing. So any questions? Questions? <laughs> okay, next guy gets set, next four girl can get set up and we'll wait for this morning. No pressure. It's just a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a little I basically got this idea from I was in my brother's apartment room and he had to run an extension cord up over the door. And it was just, he used like little Velcro stickies and put it all around and stuck it up. And it kept falling off and you bump into it and it pulled the whole thing off. You know, it set it back up. It held a bunch of pieces and just wasn't working. So I thought, I asked him like, why don't you just make a more permanent solution to it? And he said, well, we can't put holes in the wall or else the apartment will find them once he moves up. So I was thinking to myself like, maybe you could create a way to get this extension cord to stick without damaging the wall, without there being a lot of pieces. And so, next, going back, cool. And so that's kind of like what it looked like, it just doesn't look good, and then next. So for like the design process, I kind of had three criteria that I based my decision off of, that it had to look nice, it couldn't look all messy, and it had to be able to stick to the wall to solve the original problem. And most extension cords are pretty bulky, and so it needed to be compact, because I know that some place, sometimes even my computer charger doesn't reach everywhere, and I want to bring an extension cord with me, but I'm not going to bring a giant extension cord around. And then it has to be flat, because most extension cords go across the ground, and someone could just trip over that right there. But if it's flat, then you could just step right over it. Next. Next. And so this is kind of like what the, this is a, um, like a prototype of what it would look like. Um, it has to be a little bit thicker, because you have to have something to cover the wiring. Um, but and then next, um, so if you normally you want to take a, a wire and tape it up. You need a wire, you need tape, and then you have to spend the time getting a piece of tape, taping it down. And it just it looks bad, it takes too long, and it's easily pulled off. But if you have something like this where it's compact and you can just unwind it, and all you have to do is you tape it up and you just run it all the way down. And it just sticks, it's flat, and then you don't have to worry about it. If you step on it, it's smooth, it's not going to come off undone. And when you're done, you can just peel it off, roll it back up, and reuse it. So it's reusable. You don't have to find some big spot to store a giant extension cord. Yes. And then for the market potential, there's for the 20, 2015 census, there's just under 225 million households. 
And everyone in the U.S. is facing electricity now. And so every household could use an extension cord. I know I have, I don't know, like 50 extension cords in my house. So there's more than one per household. And if you partner with stores like Home Depot or Ace Hardware, the market potential is huge. And then next, if you decide to go international, all you have to do is just change the front plug or the voltage if there's different voltage. And then it can go international to any country in the world. And I just feel like that would be make our lives easier and just a simple solution to it. Can't wait to see the prototype. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you Come on, bring it. Bring it. You know I mean? Did you show up with a kayak? I tend to go outside. Yeah. I almost took a picture of me one in my backyard. You know, like a little hatch over me. Yeah, yeah. I decided not to. So my product is a kayak submarine, and I created this project because I have a lot of passion for the ocean, and I wanted to share this, and I wanted to deliver um, a unique experience. So, I mean, I got my inspiration from kind of like a James Bond means like 20,000 leagues under the sea idea. And then, like, I started researching into this. I found one guy made one, but, like, none of them are on the market. There's no patent for them. So, I mean, it's all free game on this. You press next. So, I mean, here's him paddling out. You know, turn on the air. Jumping into the sandy, pulls over the hatch, like any submersible. Uh, a little compartment over the you know, water in front of it. Be able to make it submerge into the water, and then, like, as he's going, you can see right over here this fish tail propulsion. This is kind of like his um, big flaw. This could actually like, be caught in seaweed, and it has bad maneuverability underwater. And this is like, something that could be a definite change to make this product a lot better. And then the bubbles coming out right here this is a um, release pressure. It's from like the same concept as scuba, so there's an oxygen tank in there. So, I mean, basically, same concept. You press next. So then my product, um, here's my first kind of design on it. This is from an overhead view. It's a three-person one. I figured, like, you want to share this experience with other people. I mean, like, you don't want to just go out by yourself. And plus, it's more safe. And I was kind of going for more of, like, a, a guide kind of like concept. I'll get to that later. So I made it a lot bigger. This makes it a lot more comfortable for the user. I also made it human-powered. It's basically um, environmentally friendly, but it's also, like, electric bike-assisted. It has all adjustable seats too. This makes it a lot more comfortable for the user. It makes it a lot easier to press next. And then we get to this part. There's a lot going on right here. So I mean, first innovation, I added a rudder and a keel. That makes a lot more maneuverability in the water. This makes it a lot more practical. The propeller that could cut through to kelp, basically. Um, and then I addressed the whole like safety thing. It's like you don't want to be trapped under the water and like being a death coffin. So I basically made like a back balloon that would fill oxygen, which would help you rise in like worst case scenario. And then I also made the um, hatches into two because it's so big. And then they would um, slide down in rollers so that like instead of pushing up a hatch, you basically would be like rolling down. You can't really push up a hatch when you have water going against you. It's not really practical. So I mean that's the last case scenario is an exit strategy. You press next. And then like my market, I was in the tourism industry, doing my main target market. I would sell this commercially to hotels, resorts, water sport, and water tour companies. And the whole idea is that it offers like a guide, one guide, and two consumers per next. And then San Diego would be a great place to launch this product. It's a top, tra top travel location, has over 70 miles of coastline. 34 million people visit San Diego a year. There's a it brings in $9.9 .9 billion, and there's 126 water sport and water tour companies in San Diego. Press next, and that's my presentation.
Questions? When can we go for a ride? I'll let you know. Yeah. My name is Anne Forrest and I'm presenting my being a byproduct of a wedding bracelet. But to start my presentation, I would like to take it back to uh, May 2013 when three young women were reunited with their families after one of them was able to disappear from Cleveland home where the three women were held captive for 11 years. The shocking case of Amanda Berry, Gina De Jesus and Michelle Knight provided fresh hope for parents who are still dealing with the, their own child abduction and disappearance. Thousands of people go missing in the United States every year and most of them are never heard back again. Every 40 seconds in the United States, a child becomes missing or abducted. In 80% of abductions by strangers, the first contact of the child and the abductor happens just a quarter mile from the child's home. Acting quickly is critical. 74% of abduct abducted children who are ultimately murdered are dead without, within three hours of their abduction. In a study of parents' voice by pediatricians at my clinic, at Rochester, Minnesota, nearly three quarters of parents said that they worry about their children being abducted. One third of parents said that it was a very frequent worry, a degree of fear greater than they held for any other danger, including car accidents, sport injuries, and drug addictions. I believe that modern day innovation and technology and modern communication must provide safety, security, and control to parents and their children. I believe that no child should go missing, and I think that my product can potentially reduce the number of child abductions. I think that parents should have control and ability to contact or know about their children being abducted at all times, and I think the children have should have voice and ability to warn their parents at all times. My product uh, that I developed is, this is a prototype, uh, it's not the actual product, but it's a um, similar product to it. It's very simple, and that's the beauty of it. It's very simple to use, beautifully designed, and affordable. This is a a pair of two bracelets, one for children and one for the caregiver, it might be a parent or a nanny or a grandparent. <clears throat> Once the child is in danger, he sends the signal to their parent and also to a police or 911. The parent uh, instantly gets the vibration and the message from the child. It also, the child's bracelet records the short audio that the parent and the police can listen to during the investigation. And they say it turns the GPS so parents can track their children on their mobile application that comes with it. So this is my product. It's very easy and I think it's fairly inexpensive to produce. 
after a lunch is brought in San Diego or within the United States and after the manufacturing is already established and patterns are in place, I can also um, increase the production of it and make it even more cheaper because of economy of scales and start uh, selling it or distributing it to countries of Asia and Africa where human trafficking is one of the biggest problems of today or modern days. And that's it. So my project is Limit Clean, which basically is a limiting soaked cotton ball that is used for cleaning glassware, specifically water pipes. Um, first question, what is limiting? Well, it comes from right here. It's an orange. <laughs> it comes straight out of that. Limiting takes the name from the lemon and the rind of the lemon, like other citrus fruits, contains a considerable amount of this compound, which contributes to the odor. Um, D-limonene is obtained commercially from citrus fruits through two primary methods, centrifugal separation or steam distillation. And limonene is increasingly being used as a solvent for cleaning purposes, such as removal of oil from machine parts, as it is produced from a renewable source. So the problem. Traditional method of cleaning glassware or your water pipe is by using roving alcohol and salt. It takes a while. It's messy. Salt gets everywhere, rubbing alcohol gets everywhere, your hands get all pruney, and it smells absolutely horrible the whole time you're doing it. You might get a headache or start to feel sick. So the solution. Uh, my roommate is a chemist. He had a bunch of this lemony and stuff and was telling me how it's just like a normal essential oil that's used in household cleaning products. And we got to thinking, like, why can't we use it to clean our glassware? And we figured, you know, you can't just throw it in there, it's going to do its magic and make some abrasive. So we we're like, let's soak a cotton ball, throw it in there, there's no mess, you can shake it up and it cleans the whole thing. So it's easy to use, there's no mess, and it leaves the glassware smell nice instead of horrible, like a rubbing alcohol. And the uh, market potential, so it'd be all in one package. The soak cotton ball does the whole job, you need nothing else, no mess. It's all natural, organic, renewable source. Uh, I mean, everything's towards sustainability nowadays, so I feel like that's very important. It's versatile. I mean, it's targeted at people using water pipes, but I mean, it could be used for regular glassware all the time. Um, UN reported that 158.8 million people around the world are using cannabis. I mean, take that down by half, people would smoke it out of water pipe. About 70 million people still using it. There's a lot of people who did a 
or target market. A few competitors only found one other product that uses an all-natural organic renewable source as their cleaner. And you know, it takes off real things to change how people clean their glassware. Yeah. <laughs> Look at peace water. Water? Peace water. I don't know if it is online. It's really similar. Okay, cool. It's right there out of the same right. okay. How's everyone doing? Doing well? Happy Monday. I don't know if these have said that before. Have fun, buddy. All right, of course. All right, good evening, class. My name is Brian Playhouse, and good evening, world. Uh, who here likes going to the beach, downtown, or sporting events? Who here has spent more than 20 minutes trying to find parking? Who's ever thought there has to be a better way? Well, now there is. <laughs> Roll it, this. Click on that. We'll take you to YouTube. Oh, yeah, we're on YouTube. <laughs> volume. Oh, what's the volume? Here, pause it. Pause it, pause it, pause it. How do you turn this volume up, 50? Volume. Uh, they cleverly uh, labeled as volume. So <laughs> Dude, I'm so excited for the game today. Oh, I can't wait. Dude, I hope only Pope balls out. Dude, you know it, man. Yeah, yeah, definitely. God! Why is there nowhere to ever park you? Dude, this is ridiculous. Okay, no, I'm sorry, man. I don't mean to stretch you out, because there's just never anywhere to park! Hey, I've got an idea. I don't know where did the pick and park at? No, tell me about it. Oh. <laughs> you, want the app, you pick where you want to park, and you pay. Boom. We're parking at 4951 Campanile Drive. Four hours, $10. What a deal. Whoa, that's like right here. It's so close. <laughs> sharing economy that connects homeowners with drivers uh, seeking a faster and cheaper alternative than traditional paper parking. Get it up there, Fizzy. Slide three. Okay, so market potential. What happened in 2008? The Great Recession. What stayed constant? Park revenue. Next one. Okay, you can't see this too well, but hey. Park, um, the market potential for parking is exorbitant. In 2018, it's projected to reach over $11 billion. Um, it is time for an innovative change. Um, now, next one. So making these projections was somewhat difficult. Although Pick and Park will give homeowners the freedom to set the price, um, we'll give them some, you know, some recommendations such as Airbnb. Um, I used an average of homeowners selling their driveway space at $4 an hour. Um, renting it out three times a week, and um, so our service will charge 15% um, to the homeowner on their revenue, and an additional 15% processing fee for the user. 
uh, the first month, I want to have 50 homeowners registered before the launching, or for 50 driveways. And then I expect in the next two months, 100% growth. So we got some good numbers right here. And then eventually, year one, $204,000, 514 driveways. For year two, with the success of year one, plan to take it to Orange County in Los Angeles. And then year three, go up to San Francisco. Um, next one, should uh, thank you for your time, um, <laughs> and together, let's pave the way to a brighter future. <laughs> Next up, help yourself. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Yamina and I'm going to start with a question for you. Are you a responsible consumer? Do you consider yourself now? <laughs> Good. <Yeah. laughs> so the first thing that came to mind is the consumers, right? I made a survey, online survey, just to be aware if people are know like how responsible they are, what what the what are what is behind every product that they purchase. So what I realize is that they are now. So I made three personas. One is called Anna, John, and Judy, and they all have in common that they all think they are uh, conscious consumers. They all are interested in products that are from recycled materials, and they don't even know where their clothes come from. So that was like not matching. So let's analyze this. They are conscious, but don't know where their shirt they're wearing at the moment even come from. How are they considering themselves conscious? And then they also say they're interested in sustainable products, and they want information on what it takes to create them but they don't search for that. So I started brainstorming, and first I thought of a clothing brand which uses recycling material. And then I went online, I was like, oh, it's a great idea. There's tons of, of brands that are, are doing that. Then I thought of another idea, like maybe a clothing line that's using recycled materials, but it's adding like women empowerment, creating jobs, better wages, good working conditions, et cetera, et cetera. And there's already brands that are doing that then create awareness of what it takes to create all of those products. There's already organizations that are doing that. Create awareness of the cost when you purchase things. If there's already organizations doing that. So I thought create awareness on consumers' car car carbon footprint and provide solution in one place. <clears throat> so I came up with EcoGlobe. It's one platform that will replace it not replace, but it will compete with Amazon and Etsy. It will provide only products that are made with recycled materials or have or are approaching a social issue itself. And you can search for, let's say, a jacket here. And you just type jacket, and there's already jackets addressing social issues. Or you can filter your by your preference, your education, health, or environment. That's it. That's it. All right, next up. We have five viewers watching from outside. People are very interested. Hi, five people. At least five people are. Five of your parents. <laughs> <laughs> 
Seven viewers now, no pressure at all. Seven people looking to be entertained. Eight viewers, they just keep coming. Yeah, hopefully we'll get, get up to 10. Yeah, I think. Oh, down to six, you better hurry up. So my, my name is Julius. Uh, most of you probably don't know my name because I'm from a socially awkward country in Northern Europe. But uh, <laughs> anyway, my project is called Student Help, which is basically a help app for students for their studies, mental problems, and basically life at all. Uh, and as a student who had a panic disorder, it's kind of close to me, but I hope people can assimilate. To my problem. So basically, the application is about connecting students to professionals about healthcare or their field of study, let's say creativity, Kevin, uh, incorporated into student healthcare and student services. You can get help with your theses, projects, individual future, or mental health, and hopefully, possibly someday integrate with stuff like Course Key, <coughs> Blackboard and everything, just get it into one place. Uh, I wanted to get, uh, talk about a few of the problems I had. Student interaction with professionals, I don't feel like there's a lot of it, uh, except for like conventions and stuff, but it's always a mess. Student healthcare, bring it up to the 21st century, like seriously, it's it's been the same for ages. I guess uh, legacy <laughs> systems, so basically all systems. My solutions, video call connection, fast help with problems and questions on mobile app. And here's a, a me, actually. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to bring out a picture about me so you can uh, kind of get connected uh, to the feeling that when you feel down, when you really need some help with your studies, maybe studies with this, I don't know. But basically, it would be like you. You could just grab your mobile phone, sit in front of the camera, Let's say, okay, uh, creativity and innovation. Uh, I had some problems with my project. Kevin, could you help me out a bit and get some ideas out of there? And that's basically it. And market potential. Uh, well, I only found the budget in Finland, $45 million in student healthcare. Most people in the world uh, at some point su uh, suffer from stress, minor anxiety, depression, or panic attacks at some point of their life. I know a lot of you probably have at least a small part of it. And a lot of people can use guidance for their challenging assignments and few. <coughs> but basically, that was my whole presentation. There's a few things that I can talk about yet, but all in all, that's it. <laughs> right. Next up, please get set up. Anyone didn't know I used this thing called Pecha Kucha, so basically every slide was 30 seconds. Yeah. 
You realize that a bit later. <laughs> okay. Next up. All right, guys. Uh, so my name is Ryan Mangley, and my uh, facility that I'm in college is called the Cancer Collaboration. So who here knows someone who's been diagnosed with cancer at some point in their life? Exactly everyone. That's kind of my point here. There's a very large target market for this, and there's a lot of people going through this little life-threatening illness. So here's just some career cancer statistics just to kind of give you an outlook of what's going on. So in 2016, they're projecting at least 1.7 million people to be diagnosed with cancer. Um, about 40% of people have cancer at some point in their life. Um, some get it earlier than others. and um, in 2015, it estimated 20, around 20,000 children ages of 0 through 19 are diagnosed with cancer. And as most of you guys know, if it's from previous, I happen to be one of them. So the main problem here is that um, cancer patients really lack wanting to work out and going to the gym uh, with everyone else, kind of like a regular like 24-hour fitness. No one really wants to go there. You have a lot of self-confidence self, uh, issue problems and stuff like that. Uh, here's one of my buddies, Devin, who I actually met when I was volunteering at the hospital a few years ago. This is a picture of us here. Um, and he actually came up to me and brought up this point. He's like, hey, I really want to go to the gym, but I keep getting all these like awkward looks and I'm not really sure, is there anything, like what do you do about it? And when I was when I was going through this, I wasn't really big into working out. So I was just like, yeah, it's just like push-ups at home. I didn't really do anything. But this really got the problem of uh, what's going on here. So I had some possible solutions. I was maybe thinking of phone apps, really people could just, uh, contact, stay in contact with people in your area. But I was like, no, I didn't really want to go that way. I was thinking of a restaurant, but that's kind of hard to really get started. There wasn't really too many opportunity for that. And one-on-one -on -one workouts, like the, whole, the whole reason I made this was to make it more of a group effort so people can also work out and get to know each other in the process of doing that. Uh, so my solution, the cancer collaboration. So it's going to be a gym where all camp, there's going to be all cancer patients. They can go in, not just to work out, but you can also talk with, uh, talk with each other learn about what other people are going through and stuff like that. Um, also, yeah, so they want to have different classes like yoga and kickboxing, because I know with me, I had a lot of frustration, frustration and to get that out and just to feel better, you want to be active. Uh, so why is physical activity important? There's just a couple things here. It improves self-esteem. It lowers the risk of being anxious and depressed, which I have a lot of, I know a lot of cancer patients go through that. And also the social context, that's the big part why I want group, group related, so you can really, um, stay in touch that way and also of course improving the quality of life. Uh, so the proposal is going to be kind of like a regular gym except for just more activities and the whole difference is going to be the atmosphere more than anything else. So with that, um, the reason I think feel like I could do this is because I um, went through it and have a real passion for it and I don't want to see anyone else kind of go through what I've been through. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, let's go. Next up, we're going to uh, keep things moving here. What's going on? Right. Um, Kevin, 
Hi everyone, my name is Noah, and uh, one of the things I like to do for fun is I like to go surfing. And uh, so fortunately I've been able to combine my passion of surfing with work, and what I do is I sell surfboards online. This here is a screenshot of a surf shop that sells their surfboards online. And uh, one of the things I've noticed over the past 10 years is that more and more surfboard companies or surf shops are actually selling surfboards overseas, which is creating a bigger demand for the packaging of surfboards and also the shipping of surfboards. But one of the problems I saw was, um, for our company at least, we, it takes us about 30 minutes to pack a surfboard, which is, I feel like, a big waste of time. Also, it uses a lot of material, like bubble wrap, foam wrap, uh, shrink wrap tape, some cardboard to help reinforce it. And I just thought there could be a better way to pack a surfboard. OK, so this next slide here shows us uh, the current way that our company packs surfboards. So as you can see, there's a lot of like foam wrap, um, bubble wrap, a lot of shrink wrap tape. Uh, we got some cardboard here to help reinforce it. And uh, we have to get a lot of different kinds of materials to kind of, you know, pack a surfboard. And, uh, you know, uh, that's one of the biggest drawbacks. Also, when the customer receives a product, it's just a lot of waste. Like, it's, it's like, uh, you know, you're shipping some trash along with the surfboard. Okay, so this picture here shows like a, a brand new surfboard. The customer just got it. As you can see, there's a lot of plastic, a lot of uh, you know bubble wrap, a lot of um, you know different kinds of things that were used to pack the surfboard. Some of it is cardboard, which you can actually recycle, which is you know which is good. But a lot of it is going to go into the dumpster or also in the in the landfill. So again, we're just trying to reduce that that kind of waste that goes into packing surfboard. So as I was brainstorming, I came across this idea of uh, you know you're able to slide a product into a sleeve, inflate it around the product, and it kind of conforms the shape of your product. So I thought this could be a great solution for packing surfboards. It's very lightweight. Uh, one of the biggest drawbacks with shipping surfboards is it's you know, very heavy, and uh, you know, this, this would actually be a lot less waste. And so finally, the solution I came up with is basically an idea similar to that where you would actually slide the surfboard into the plastic sleeve, you inflate it, it would cut your packing time into like seconds versus 30 minutes for a surfboard. Um, you know, if you're doing multiples, it, it would definitely cut, cut down a lot of the time. Also, one of the ideas I had was maybe um, creating like a, a day use bag out of this where maybe a customer can like take their board into the car if they're traveling, it'll cut down a lot of the time with packing a surfboard. And yeah, that's basically it. Okay. All right, next up. <coughs> hey, at the end of these presentations, pay it off again. Tell me, and there you have the, the new technique for, patch, for packaging surfboards, right? Reinforce it in my mind. It'll make it memorable. So instead of just signing off and piecing out, boom, tell me, and there you have the most modern version of a blah, blah, blah. Um, Let's go next up. Get set up, please.
One thousand viewers now. Just for that. Maybe a little less. All right. Well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Connor McKeown, and the product that I've innovated is what I'm calling Divvy Up. Um, so. I don't have to the kids. the kids are. Do not talk about me as a mother. This is sick to death. You talking about me as a mother and what I've done wrong. Do not talk about that. I am sick of you accusing me of not being a good mother. Seven years I've been a good mother. Just remember what we read out. Just remember. I'm turning a bat. Don't you fucking talk about me being a mother. I hate you. Hey, I can make all right, well, I hope that was a lighthearted introduction to what I consider to be a serious subject, and that would be uh, the arguing that parents go through when they get divorced and when it comes to finances. Um, so what I have innovated is an application designed to remove the need for verbal communication before, between divorcees when dealing with finances. Um, so how did I come up with that? My parents got divorced a year ago, um, and that's something they deal with all the time is my dad gets called from my mom, hey, I gave 20 bucks to Jack for gas, I need $10 from you. They have an agreement where they pay half of what the kids pay, uh, what they give the kids. So they don't like talking to each other, and this application would remove uh, the need for them to do that. So what I've done is satisfy a need for a tool to deal with finances that removes the need for them to communicate. Um, so what this will do will allow for the transfer of funds between individuals and require a receipt picture. Um, so what I'm doing is targeting divorced parents, um, which there are 60 million uh, Americans married and about uh, divorces, 50% uh, of divorces and 50% and of marriages end in divorce, excuse me. Um, so I know what you're thinking. How is this different from Venmo? Well, there are a couple things. And here you can see this is a simple couple pictures from the Venmo application. And what I would like to have uh, change here is I don't think Venmo is serious enough, nor does it uh, require any proof of what the purchase is. So uh, if someone just sent a picture um, with a receipt saying, hey, you owe me this much, it's much simpler than seeing a little emoji with a margarita or whatever it is. Um, and what we'd be doing would be taking the social media factor out of Venmo to make it more serious to appeal to an older market. Um, so what this does, Divi Up solves the need of a unique market using a proven system that would be adapted to our target. Um, so that concludes my presentation. Are there any questions? And I think in 22 years, I pretty much understood what was the two biggest problem of Paris City. So the first big problem in Paris is the lack of space because we have buildings everywhere. It's crowded. We don't like everybody is living in apartments. 
So we don't have gardens. So we don't have like green space because just the really, really rich people can afford like a house and a garden. So that's the like first biggest problem of my city. And then the second problem is the pollution. So as all the big city in the world, we have a lot of pollution. The good thing is like Paris and people are really aware of the climate change. So for example, we bike a lot. Some roads have been closed to have bicycle paths instead. So people really want to change things. And so the solution to the two big problem would be the green walls. So the green walls can be the solution because first of all, it gives you an illusion of a garden, even if it's not it's still an illusion. And then it improve the air quality, so that it will decrease the pollution. But the thing is, it's expensive and just professional can make it. No one, like it's really complicated actually. So my idea was to help people like you and me to have the green walls in the house, like in the balcony or even inside. So the idea is to have a conceptor when the people can go and I will provide the structure with the water system and everything ready. And then the people would just have to choose the plants that they want and the flowers that they want. So of course it would depend if it's indoor or outside, but because plants cannot be the same. But for example, me, I like the red, so I would take red in my in my beautiful green wall. And then like I would have my unique green wall, nobody else will have the same, and that would be just mine, and no one else will have the same. But this uh, the green wall can just stay between seven and ten years, so it's pretty much like it's it's pretty long, and it will be pretty cheap, like it can be around two hundred euro of euros, so it's pretty much the same in dollars, and so it's pretty cheap for something who can stay during 10 years. And also the maintenance will be really easy. You just have to put some nutrients into the water every every week. So it's just once every week, it's not a lot. And the market can be, I think the market can be really huge because the green wall is really new. It's something that just new from like 10 years ago and it's growing really, really fast. So by 2070, more than, 4.2 million of meter squares of green wall will be around the world. So it's a big, big amount of green walls. And why I choose Paris? Because first of all, it's my city. So I think it can work there. But also because Paris are really Paris city is really aware of the green walls. And they just adopt a law that uh, will like ask Paris city to have more than 100 hectares of vegetation on walls. green wall and you can choose whatever you want on it so it will be really unique and I think it could be a really great solution for the pollution and the lack of space in Paris. That's it. My name is Florian, and uh, I'll tell you a bit about my idea. It's called the Sober Shabble. It's a mobile app. And uh, let, let me first tell you about how I got this idea. On my way back from Vegas, we all have one friend in our, in our circle who's like always a bit over the top, a typical like 
hangover guy who he, he, does, he didn't know where his money is going, he didn't know where his business night. So he was, he was like, oh my flow and how I get figured out, I really, really need to figure out and work on my drinking behavior. So, so I thought like, how, how could I help this guy? And I thought about an app, a smartphone app. It's like, it's simply a GPS tracking system. It's, it's tracking your position. On, uh, uh, depending on this GPS on your phone and calculates a drunk level during your trip and provides an overall st a long term statistic in the end. So what does it mean? So let's do it step by step. The first step is pretty easy. It's just like, like only simple GPS tracking. So all, all of our phones have like GPS, so you could have seen like we started at MGM Grand, went to the Hot Browse in Las Vegas, and ended up in the Omnia nightclub. So we all get tracked in this way. I just wanted, I just only want my phone to like see. Where, where did I go and for how long have I been here? The more interesting step is the next step. It's like drunk level analysis. So I thought about how, how could I figure out how drunk I am in that night without like connecting a phone to my blood or to my breath. So, so I then just like <laughs> think around, just like fooling around. And then, and then I got the idea that so, some apps are already running. It. There are all, all these sports apps are already using like run analysis like this uh, acceleration sensors like how i move they give like they, they give you some feedback on your running style and stuff and i was like what if my phone could figure out how drunk i am by the way i'm moving <laughs> and, yeah, you, you know when i'm drunk it's all a bit different it's like drunk people tend to move like slower and they're like rolling around and what if the, if these sensors like could figure out how drunk i am depending on like how 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 strong i'm wobbling in here and like say, give, give you a quick review the next day. Like say, okay, uh, after you left Omnia and went to Caesar's Palace, this was a hell of a trip. Uh, <laughs> you, you probably spent all, all of your money in Caesar's Palace, depending on like you were wobbling around. So next, I, I think it's pretty pretty funny to see some like long term statistics. So so if you like have this app for like half a year and you stayed in San Diego, this app could pr probably tell you like what, what what is your bar behavior or your club behavior. Like you will like see like in, in flux. It's like they, they, this is the average time you stay in flux and, and the other way it's like you're drunk level. So you see I'm staying longer in flux but a bit drunker in uh, Omnia more the way. We, we we can also do it in like city bases. So San Diego, I stay long in San Diego, it's not all over because it's pretty more extreme. Right? <laughs> I, I think this would be like after half a year, you have so much data, it's like really you can see it. Check out every city you've been in, like what's the bars, what's the best bike, you want to get wasted, ready to go. It's all about that. So let's, in the end, let's talk about the target group. I checked the target group, and I think our main target is like smartphone users. They're all like 21 to 30 years old, maybe a bit younger in other countries. Uh, they are definitely alcohol consumers and uh, they are oriented for party and fun. And that, yeah, like, I, I took a look at the statistic from the uh, pre research center, and here yeah, I figured out it's mostly us. It's like co college students, like <laughs> from eight, 18 to 49 years. Okay, maybe I, I put it down to 21 to 30 years as one way to make it too old for them. And yeah, the smartphone market is huge, the potentially downloading numbers are like 200 and 36 million smartphones on the market in the US. So I think it's probably like it's money in there. Money is there. So if you have any questions, just ask me. Thank you. <laughs> Who would download us on their phone right now? <laughs> All right. There you go. I can think like high scores. Yeah, high scores. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like, yeah, like this is just a gym which you can go for. <laughs> By the way, it doesn't go away with.
page. If you're in that last category, if you're in the party oriented One million viewers. We just hit one million viewers. Really? No. Uh, <laughs> all right, guys. Um, all right. My name is Huang. Uh, my first and last name is the same, so Huang Huang. That's my name. Okay. All right. Um, as everyone knows that um, previously, um, we have our like um, like the pitching for ideas, and then my idea was having the um the pressure trash can to build in the car. And that was a um, cover. So my idea was to uh, um, have a build. <laughs> Have a billion trash can. <laughs> okay. Maybe I should clap this a little bit. Okay. Uh, so my idea was to having a um, billion trash can in the car, which is because I was uh, super lazy. I don't want to like go to uh, throw away all the trash. <coughs> Every day I have in it. So, kind of like the idea that he, okay, that actually was uh, from a picture <coughs> on uh, Google that I found that they have a um, And this, uh, you guys say like I'm not creative enough. So I built and developed my idea. So I'm gonna have something and I focus it on building. So that was kind of my idea, main focus point. So I turn out I wanna have a why don't why don't I just have a, a studio called building that I can help out people to building this stuff. So I know that um, in the United States they have so many different kinds of uh, studio. They have an art studio, educational studio, poetry, blah, blah, blah. There's a tons of it. But my studio is a studio for, uh, for people to use your imagination. Whatever you can think of it, we're going to help you to like, build it up, to make it come true, become a true product that um, that you want to have, want to have. Little guy, little guy, little guy. Uh, the idea, I want to have this, this, this. And then what we're going to have is a group of us going to help out, say no problem. We definitely can help you out with that. And um, all right. What my idea was a uh, um, basically like, for example, if I can help people to, especially uh, students, can help them to like build a printer in their car or a table in the car, which is very really useful. I think for most of students like. Uh, frustrating about like, oh, I need to go to the school to stay in the library, to write my paper, and then to print it out. If I can have my studio to help people out to do this kind of thing. Was that interesting? I know you might ask me about the market potential. And let me turn that around. Like, how creative are you? <laughs> uh, it's going to be um, that question is going to be is saying like that's the market potential, All right? So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay.
Next, get set up, please. to tell you about my idea pop-up chef so I got this idea when I went home to Los Angeles and I saw in my favorite coffee shop that they had a sign in the window and it said um, they were holding a pop-up restaurant for a couple days and I was like a pop-up restaurant and a coffee shop like this must be a thing so I started looking up restaurants on LA Weekly and I was like oh my gosh there are so many of these pop-up restaurants and I think it's kind of happening in big big cities like Los Angeles and I had this idea that
for retail stores such as Best Buy, and like my offer will be limited to uh, fifty thousand uh, uh, units, so like it will sell fast. But uh, well, I, and, like I want to set up a contract with Best Buy, like renewable every two years, so I can get a huge discount. So I'm pretty sure, like, if I make half of uh, of their sales like in one day, I could get a pretty huge discount. <laughs> Uh, well, so the new price would go down to fifty-three dollar a month. Uh, well, now you get to figure like how can I do it because it has to be profitable. Well, at the end of the two-year period, I'll just get back like all the TV sets, sound system, and consoles and games. And I, I, even after two years, it still have value. So I made a little estimate like based on today's uh, like what's happening today of what will be the future value of these products. So I have a value of like a little less than nine nine hundred bucks. So like I also want to develop another like uh, partnership with the uh, like second hand uh, resell resellers. Uh, so like the second hand value of uh, of my of my products uh, is uh, like eight hundred and ninety dollars, and I will sell them for four hundred bucks to uh, to the second hand market. It's a, it's a market like who is very profitable because most people can can buy it. Like new and the and the price drops very fastly because like as as I told you the like the renewal period is almost two years every two years there is a new TV set a new console so like after two years the price uh, the price drops like very badly so well that that will be my offer and like with the fifty thousand units I I'll get back I can make a profit of twenty million after two years so in this model everybody is happy. Like including the kids, the parents. The parents are not annoyed by their kids. They can watch like a pretty good movie with the last home cinema set. Uh, even that's why it's happy because uh, because they, they made a lot of sales in one in one uh, in one day, and they know they can like renew it every two years with with the contract we have. And even cash converters or cash generators, the resellers that always still be used with secondhand products are happy because they need a stable a stable uh, supply and. Uh, like stable quality and quantity, so they know how to expect. And my offer will be limited to 50,000 offers because if I go above this this uh, this number, well, then cash converter and the other uh, secondhand resellers won't have the the ability to resell all the products that I that I have, so I won't be able to make any benefits, any profits. So that's my model. That's what I want to do. I think it's not like efficient to buy anything anymore. Like instead for an investment, it's better to rent it out. And like to offer this kind of premium model to customers, to consumers. So they like even if they don't own anything at the end of the period, they don't feel unhappy because they know that it's going to be like, keep on going and being replaced. So I think it's a pretty good investment, and I will do it. So, so there you go. Right. Okay. Right, next up. Uh, who just presented? Where the heck? There you are. Don't forget the land. You give back to people in military. All of a sudden, even though you don't get that twenty thousand, you get a huge PR boost because now you're handing that to people who really need it. So people know your company inside out. Okay. 
Hi, my name is Laura. I bought all of these products, um, beauty products, um, out of several different reasons. But you never know which one is good until you tried it at home and already bought it. And so many of the beauty buys end up being just a waste of money. And that's not how it should be, because you can use your money better than that. So my idea was to create a community where you can rate products and post pictures and also videos how you applied it, so the others can see and read if they still want to buy it. And the inspiration for that came to me when I sat in a different class and we talked about Yelp and um, how they rate the restaurants and where you can get new inspiration to go when you are in different cities. And so I thought when I brainstormed about the problem I just mentioned, that that would be great if we have something like that for beauty products. Um, I put myself in the mind of several different types of people. So people who know much about beauty products or absolutely nothing, or something in between who just want to search for something new. And there are so many things you can buy, from cheap to almost no price limit. But which one should you pick? And then I thought of where the different kinds of people can get their inspiration from. So maybe they're friends, but that doesn't have to be that the friends um, use the products that are good for your type. And then you have the employees in the store <clears throat> who can show you some products, but they probably will tell you to buy the expensive ones and not the ones good for you. And then you have the last stop, it's social media. But many people from there, they get sponsored by organizations and only post the product <coughs> because of that. And so you can't really rely on that. So that's why I thought that a website where you can rate the beauty products um, would be very helpful for all those people I just mentioned. And it will also include profiles where you can write about your skin type and hair conditions and so on so the others can see if they can re really relate to your comment. And you can also look which product got the best rating in total when you know nothing about beauty products. In addition, it also came to my mind that you can add a few links where you can buy those products, so it will you link you directly to the store, or if you don't want to buy it online and first try it on your hand or something, it can show you where the nearest five shops you can buy it. And I thought that will help most of the people who deal with those problems and spend a lot of money and not being happy at the end. And there you will have a new modern way of comparing beauty products. Next up, please. How many people have to present still? Raise your hand. Yeah. 
We're good? Please. Okay. <clears throat> Good evening, class. My name is Ben Bessay. This is my individual presentation. All right, so say it's any weeknight, you decide to get together with the squad, you turn up, go somewhere, but you're not sure where to go. You don't want to go to someplace instead. You want to waste your money on a cover charge to get in because you ain't going to see that again. It sucks. So, what do you do? There's no sort of app out right now, at least that I know of, where you can go to look up, see what's popping, what's not. So, introducing the spot. The Spot is a smartphone app right now that we are putting together that's uh, going to start for iPhones. And what it is is a real-time uh, data sharing feed between users where you can take a picture of a venue inside or out. You can post a caption. You can show if there's a cover charge. You can show the DJing, if there's a dress code, uh, if the bartenders suck, or anything like that. And it'll provide uh, the users outside a glimpse into the venue or the outside so you can see what's going on without actually having to be there. And that will be through a live feed where you can break it down uh, by the venue type, dive bar, sports bar, nightclub, pub, anything like that, whatever it is you're looking for. So basically what the spot will do is we'll keep you from ending up here because who the hell wants to end up there? And it'll land you right there where the action is. That's where everybody wants to be, right? So like I said before, this is done by the use of the, uh, the combined feed where members take pictures, they add it to the feed, Venues can do this themselves, they'll give them a little boost in their own business. And uh, everything from night, nightclubs, bars, dive bars, sports bars, pubs, all that stuff wrapped into one, and it'll provide you all the information in real time. Everything's real time, so it's not like Snapchat where it posts for 24 hours, or Instagram where you can take the picture and post a rubber. It's take the picture, you post it, it's live right then and there, and that's what's going on. So it'll use that as well as a map. It will show, which will show you the venues within a certain radius of wherever you are. We'll uh, have access to the user's location and uh, let you know what you're looking for. Help you find what you're looking for. So that's it. That's uh, that's the spot. And then as we grow revenue and hopefully uh, we end up with some profit, we'll be giving some of that back to uh, probably veteran, some sort of veteran pro organization or something like that. Because three of us on the team are all uh, Marine Corps vets, so we'll probably end up coming back. That's it. That's the spot. All right, next up. Yeah. Uh, website is the spot I don't know if there's any time with Mogul of what the John is doing for us. Well, hello everybody. I'm Alison de Montpellier, and I'm gonna present you my new concept of wine bar, the mystery to wine bar. So um, it's pretty easy to understand. Just get on the perpetual wineries discovery program. Well. Please one more surprise us. That's the need I um, I um, I saw. People who go to wine bar want to be surprised. They want to discover new stuff. And here it's a um, quotation of Letiti, a journalist of the Wall Street Journal, and she's complaining about the fact that sometimes she just go to wine bar and she finds the same wine that she would have found in the grocery store. Well, so people want to discover new things. They want to be surprised, but how to do that? Two weeks ago, I went to Temacula, 
and for wine tour, and I discover amazing wine. But the fact is, wineries just sell their wine at their domain. So if you don't do wine tour, you will never heard about them. You can find the wines in the restaurant, in the bar, or at the grocery store. What's the pity? I discovered amazing wines, and I want to share this wine uh, to people. Well, that's where that's where my idea came from. I want to refer to propose to my customers a one bar where each month we will have a new guest winery with a new wine menu dedicated to the winery of the month. A wine testing class the first Thursday of the period. Like that, my customer will um, know more about the winery, winery of the month. Uh, and they will be, they will discover how to test wine. Um, we will educate them about, um, yeah, the wine history, everything. And of course, they will learn about the winery and its history. And you will love my place. Why? Because I will also surprise you with amazing tapas, and you will have a new uh, tapas menu every month as well. And you know what? You can just let me choose the tapas for you, and I, I assure you that you will, you will love it. You will not be disappointed. It will be a cozy place, and you will discover amazing bands. Well, why it's a great opportunity for the wineries? First, it's a showcase of their savoir-faire right in the center of the city. They make themselves better known, make profit, and get new customers. And there is a market here in the United States. There are the millennials. So just on figures, last year they consumed 42 percent of the of all of the wine sold in the United States. And when they go out, they drink 3.1 glasses at an average. So it's pretty big because it's only 1.9 for the boomers. They want to discover new wines. They want to try wines from all over the world. And they are really, really, really um, and like happy to pay more for wine experiences. Last thing, they use a lot the social media, and that's a really good thing for my business because thanks to them, I will communicate easier about my wine bar. And it's also a good argument for my to send my concept to the wineries. And finally, as you can see here, each year you have more and more wineries created. And that's a really good thing because that means just a lot of wineries are waiting to be discovered. So that's my project, that's my wine bar. I'm pretty sure it can work and it will be kind of this design, it's a French wine bar. I love that. I love this kind of table. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next up. Let's get set up, please. Oh, I got it. <laughs> I like you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> so while, while we're getting set up for our next one, uh, any great revelations so far after all these presentations? What are you learning from all this? I learned to use Prezi, because Prezi is a <laughs> it's a cool Pre application. Right. <laughs> Does Prezi, uh, is that a little more wild than PowerPoint? Yeah. yeah right? right. Well, PowerPoint goes this and this. Just this, this, this. Yeah. What else do you need? Any other big observations? The party apps aren't by guys. The what? The party apps. The party apps? Aren't by guys. Okay. <laughs> yeah, of course. Anybody else? What are you learning? What should you do more of? What are you saying? Discuss more with the audience and deal with like a lot of entertainment really. It's not talking, it's really all about entertainment. What should you do less of? <coughs> read. Again, do not read your slides, do not look down and just read. Okay? You can send that in. Ready, bud? Okay. Music festivals. Who here went to Coachella? Anyone? You went to Coachella? Does anyone go to music festivals in general, like EC, Outside Lands, Life is Beautiful, anything like that? Do you guys want a free extra ride home through Uber or Lyft? Yeah. All right. So my idea is a public relations campaign for large alcohol corporations to appear more socially responsible by being your designated driver. So how does that work? So alcohol corporations sponsor a free ride on Uber or Lyft at music festivals. So you would get one free $35 ride. You'd get a whole, and then you would actually have to, to get that ride, do a get home safe agreement. So the get home safe agreement entails, you're gonna register your address or a location to get dropped off on. You're gonna sign up an emergency contact because Uber drivers I have to deal with really drunk people want someone to talk to. And you have to sign an agreement to not drink and drive because that's the whole point of this app or this idea is for people not to go out, drink, and drive, and get hurt. So, we're going to look at... This was a Super Bowl ad that was done by Bud Light during, during Super Bowl. We're here with Bud Light Party Superdelegate Michael Pena to talk about diversity. America is a nation of immigrants. We're a smorgasbord of cultures. A Korean taco of togetherness. And everything made with one of us a different seed. I thought it was also a nice seed. What a protein of harmony. A gumbo. A consistency. We're a never-ending, bottomless, all-inclusive, super buffet. I can't do any more metaphors. No. Seriously, right. I'm full. Alright. So, back to cost. That Super Bowl ad cost $5 million just to air for those 30 seconds. So if you go to a music festival, there's 9,000 average music festival goers that are of drinking age. So if you do $35 a ride times 9,000, which you probably won't get everyone to do it, it's $315,000 per music festival, which is a steal. All right, so the market potential. If there's a large uptrend in social responsibility, going green, Connecting with charities, so with this idea, you could connect with a bunch of different charities that are against drunk driving because there are a lot out there. And it helps large alcohol corporations, Uber and Lyft, to have brand recognition and marketing. So finally, what my app or my idea does, it allows alcohol distribution companies the ability to become more socially conscious or have the appearance of being more socially conscious. It's a great advertising campaign for Uber and Lyft and people get home safe, which is the most important aspect of my idea. So, thank you.
If you could switch in the seat, you could have the Super Bowl, but you would have to wait until the Prussian seat to get which is a fucking sponsor for the job. You're still running that seat. So I think it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and this is my project. So for several years I've been passionate about art and more particularly urban contemporary art that you can see right here. Um, in some countries it's embraced. Uh, you can see Banksy at every corner um, in London. But in most parts of the world it's still not recognized as uh, a movement. Another problem that we can see is that the art world today um, is becoming more and more all about money and not about uh, what the artist has to say. Contemporary art is being is losing its liberty and is becoming a shopping window. Um, sorry. Young artists cannot evolve anymore, and the main goal for my project is to get recognition for these artists worldwide. I tried to do that when I was in Kenya. I worked six months in an art gallery, and we did an exhibition with two uh, young artists and one very famous artist. Um, it was a great success. We had 200 people go at the opening, and most of the works were sold, except the ones of the famous artist, who wasn't a trend anymore. So he didn't want to work with us anymore, and so obviously this is not a solution that can work everywhere. So how can we get the artist actually to come to the public, and not the public to come to the artist? So I thought, first of all, of a stall or a booth that you could put in a street. But that wouldn't work because you don't have enough space to put everything. You do not, You would only show one artist and not several ones. And even so, it's not a very traditional structure for an art gallery. Then I thought, uh, why not do a pop-up store? Um, it's very common. You see it with restaurants or with shops. But the thing is, it's too costly. You have a lot of costs that depend on advertisement or even renting locations. And as I said, it's been done before. So I needed something new. So I came back to Paris. And I was waiting for a bus, and it just dropped by, and it, the whole bus was covered with a huge ad for an exhibition for the Louvre. And I thought, well, this is the best idea ever. Why not put all of the art in the bus and just drive the bus to the people? So what I would do is drive the bus all around the world, get some artists that maybe you haven't seen in your life, but these artists that I'm showing right now are all over the world, and some of which I've already had contacts with, and are ready to participate in this project. Um, and we would go to city to city, country to country, but most of all, to art fairs. Art fairs is a place to be where you want to stand out and make a buzz. And this is the place to be to get this artist recognized. Um, it's a new idea it was only associated with this project. And it, it entices curiosity, and it's temporary. The ephemeral part of the project is very important, because people only have that one opportunity to discover these people and to be part of the project. 
Another important thing is that this is a very dynamic market and it's always evolving. 50% of the sales are made through galleries and 19 through art fairs. And the international art market is also evolving um, higher. It's 17% this semester and 70 million uh, consume art today when at the end of World War II, there were only 500,000. So I hope to see you all in my bus and thank you for your time. All right, next guest set up, please. Hello everyone, my name is Rose and my product my product is Bright Bag. Um, so as you can see, Bright Bag, like I'm not gonna switch your awesome like nice Louis Vuitton bag for a glow up bag or something like that. What I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna enhance your bag. So what that means is that I'm gonna put um, something that add, adds value to it, but doesn't distract from the beauty of your of your bag. Um, I came up with this idea because I always walk across campus at night. You know, we get out of here like 9:20, so it's kind of dangerous. I don't want to seem like, you know, I don't want to turn on my flashlight and be like, like I'm scared or something like that. So I don't want to attract attention to me. So what I want to do is want to have um, a light inside my bag that I'm able to open it, find my keys, find whatever I need for my bag. Uh, without attracting any attention at all. Um, so the, uh, the way that this looks, I'm not like the best drawer ever or whatnot, but it basically be um, something like this. This would be the side of it. Um, it's basically, I don't want the light to be coming from up down. I want it to be coming from um, the top uh, down. So then that way you can see the bag and not um, glare everywhere. Uh, so that's the bottom of it that has the lights. Um, it has an on and off switch that would obviously be a button so you would be able to find it easily. Um, the main target market for for the one I initially started off with was for ladies, college professionals um, that usually have bigger bags because they have like pretty much their whole life in there. Uh, so it's something for them to easily access everything they have. Um, then one of the classmates mentioned hiking. Um, so like who here has backpacks and like they take in their hiking trips and they needed to um, they need to find stuff in there and they need light and they want to have like put the flashlight in their mouth and like try to look for stuff, you know? Uh, so it'd be an easy way for them to access the stuff that they have in there. Also little kids, like little kids go camping all the time. It's a lot more beneficial for them to have something that's already in place for them to be able to, to get their stuff. Um, I thought about LED lights just because they last a little bit longer. Uh, also, you don't want to ruin your bags. You want it to be pretty uh, removable. I saw some that, like I mentioned before, they you stitch onto there. I don't want to stitch anything onto my bag. First of all, it takes too much time. You need thread and the needle and everything. I just want to place it on there. Uh, so I thought about 3M. 3M has products that you're able to take it off uh, without leaving any residue. Um, so I thought it was a good idea to 
put 3M and then my product as well on there. Uh, so yeah, that's bright bag for you. <laughs> <laughs> How many more people? What is that? And two. And then we're two. How do I get out of here and go to the period? So we're getting a little love on LinkedIn, we're getting a little Twitter love, a little Facebook. All right, guys, my name is Emiliano Bonano, and today I'm presenting uh, a failed sobriety test for uh, marijuana patients. Um, marijuana is a multi billion dollar industry, and uh, it has been changing the way we do things. Uh, before it was illegal, now it's legal in 18 states, and now uh, there are some issues that are arising from these new uh, laws that are passing, and we are missing uh, a field sobriety test for marijuana patients, okay? Right now, the three sobriety tests that uh, police officers use in on, on the field are for alcohol only, and there's no field sobriety test for marijuana. Okay. Uh, the current issues um, that we have and trends um, now, for the first time, uh, people are allowed to legally have uh, cannabis in their system while they're driving. Uh, before, if you have any marijuana in your system, you couldn't drive. And what it's made was like patients could not be able to drive or go to work. Uh, the anticipated increase in cannabis use rates. Uh, uses, uh, raises public safety and concerns, particularly in the law enforcement community. They don't know how to handle this issue. And um, previously, and with alcohol-related incidents, we know that uh, as it is now, there's many issues relating to the accuracy and, and efficacy of the three right uh, tests that we do. Um, 
several allegations of there's also been several allegations of police officers lying in, in DUI uh, police reports. Uh, sometimes when you do the sobriety test, uh, you think or you are passing, but then when you get your police report, what you did and what what it says on the police report is not consistent. And there's several allegations of you know the the officer just lying to like win the case. Um, because of that, there's a need of like creating a test that is standardized for marijuana so to eliminate uh, any possible issues of officer having to input personal impressions or notes and um, and have something with an app that could actually like solve the problem you know and um, these are the three current like surveillance tests that we have right now uh, you have some some actually may may say that they have been like set up for people to, to fail, and people who are actually sober uh, in clinical studies have also failed these exams. Okay, so for example, this one, there's the you know if the of where the the area where you're actually doing the test is not even, you could actually fall and, and fail this already test. Uh, people are, have like a poor balance, and they could also uh, fail that. And also the the smooth track of your eye is also another one that people could be sober and also fail. Uh, this is up for interpretation, and even though it's standardized, uh, there have been issues with it. So this is a new problem that has been, you know, we, that we have. For the first time, people are allowed to drive with cannabis in the system, but there is a need for fill and permit tests for marijuana patients that we trust. How do we do that? We do that by creating a, a, an application that actually have uh, standardized brain games that actually test for you know, imbalance, coordination, reality, uh, sorry, uh, for they are critical. The test for reaction time, perception, time perception, balance, and memory. Uh, the test needs to be accurate, reliable, credible, and should be no room for manipulation. Can be used in court and accepted by police, patients, and court in the court system. Okay. Um, so the prototype that I came up with was uh, an app that could go in any mobile device a police officer uh, gives to the person driving. And imagine uh, iPad-like, where you actually hand the, the officer hand uh, a five-minute exam where it has like like brain games. Think of Luminosity, where these are games that are very simple, but they have been like done based on decades of research on human brain performance. Okay. Uh, the exam would be very simple and will give a, a pass or no pass answer. This will also be for the, uh, the cannabis patient to like use at home before he start driving or by the police officer, but it's standardized. It's, a, it's an application that they can download and everybody has it. So if I'm a, a cannabis patient, I could actually do the test for five minutes and say, okay, I can pass. If that that result will go directly into an iCloud or some storage where like the police has no room for manipulating. If, a, if, if there is a no pass, then the person driving knows that he didn't pass and you can he can trust that that result instead of doubting it. And also the core system can do that. So that's basically uh, my presentation. Any questions? Thank you.
Um, hey, my name is Susanna, and I'm talking about the camouflage lip color, which is supposed to uh, make you go from natural to both effortlessly. So, um, I've thought about the difficulties of the modern women, especially in the business sector, and I've seen that if you want uh, your outfit to look put together and have a like chic, effortless, um, put together look, yeah. I basically um, like to put on some makeup, focus on the lips. Also, lipstick is one of the things which are first recognized when you're talking to somebody. So there are some problems with that. If we focus on lipstick, you always like have to correct it and retouch it, and you really don't want it to smudge over your, your uh, clothing or something. Um, so you always have to worry about it, staying in place, etc. Um, so I saw an opportunity to make something up which would be uh, convenient, reliable, and very easy to use. That's basically, I'll just go to the issue. Yes. So uh, I came up with a lip color which would be long lasting. You only have to apply it once in the morning. It would stay on your lips the whole day, won't fade away. And it would change, so that's the camouflage part, it would change the shading to a more intensive, darker color. So we have three pictures of one of my favorite makeup artists, by the way. She's amazing. She's one of my inspirations. <laughs> so we have the first shade in the morning. You want something fresh looking, which says, yes, I'm awake, ready to do this. So it's a very like soft and, yeah, shiny glow. Then when we, uh, like, we had lunch, we're at noon, we have, we have like, a little low, we need something to pick me up, like a coffee, but something fun, fresh. I'm here, I'm gonna do the rest of the day. And that would be like a bit of a deeper color. I took a nude color for that one, so I thought those pictures were like uh, best framed. But you can also choose like a bright red color or maybe an intensive purple for that. So when you leave work, want to have some fun, want to enjoy yourself, or just want to relax with some friends, you can go out and the color will change. Not instantly, but over time. So you don't have to reapply it, you don't have to worry about it. Just if you had like an eight or 10 hour work day, you can just go out, put on a different jacket or something, put on heels, and you're good to go. So that's basically it. Also, I thought of um, the target market. I've done a like, little survey. Um, Different women, different ages, different kind of lifestyles, and I found out that nine out of ten women would purchase it. Uh, one woman who did it was my mom because she's almost 60 and she likes to stick to, uh, stick to one lip color and that's all. So, otherwise, it was quite a success. Um, my target group would be young to middle-aged women. Basically, like I tested it on yes, 12 to uh, yeah, 59, and it was successful on age. 12 to uh, 42. So that would be my basic target group. Um, women should be, so those women should be um, alpha concerned, want to look appropriate for every like daytime or occasion. And it's easy to use. So it's uh, as well for experienced makeup users, such as um, makeup artists, and also for beginners, because it's, yeah, pretty easy. Um, and I also thought there would be a like whole new market potential if you um, apply that concept to other cosmetics, for example, mascara. So in the, in the morning, you want something light, natural, like, yeah, I'm awake, I'm looking good, I don't want to spend the whole morning on painting my face. When you're going out, women tend to 
code um, to code some other uh, to layer some more codes on it to make it look like ready for the night. So that would be another option to maybe expand to that product to make it even darker. And yeah, it's basically the same. So that's it from natural to bold effortlessly. Yeah. And that was just to, yeah, I definitely carry all of that around with me. So that sucks. <laughs> that's the problem solved. <laughs>